Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Astro Views. It's the show where we talk to interesting people about their connection with the universe. My name is Ryan and today my guest is a good friend of mine. We worked at the Science Center together. We've crossed paths a lot. We did the Museum of the Moon in Toronto last year. We can talk about what that is a little bit later. But uh, she is a, a moon expert and she'll tell you all about that. This is Sarah Mazrui. How are you, Sarah? Hi, Ryan. I'm good. Thanks for having me on your show. Well, I'm glad you could join me today. I'm, I'm really excited to talk to um, people with very diverse backgrounds in astronomy. Now, you are a, a PhD uh, planetary scientist, um, and so we're, you're one of the pure astronomers that we're actually talking to, which is really exciting um, for me because I can really kind of let loose with the space questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know. Astronomers sometimes don't like to call me an astronomer because I don't study things that are far enough. So I'm like, I'm always like, planetary science, close to Earth, closer to Earth. <laughs> yeah, I had another guest recently who was talking a lot about the moon. And so I would, first of all, totally disagree with that sentiment. I think the moon is pretty far away, as you know. Um, and, you know, people talk about the moon because it's the thing that's there, right? It's the thing that we see. And that's that's it was, that's what this uh, previous guest was saying too, is that we can all experience the moon, we can all see it. But again, I'll let you talk a bit more about that. So first of all, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us um, who you are, what, you're, what you do in astronomy and space. That would be wonderful. Sure. Um, so I wear a few different hats. I'm a planetary scientist by training. I'm also a science communicator and an educator, um, and I work in different fields. So I, as you mentioned, I work as a host at the Ontario Science Center. So I get to do some planetarium shows. I get to interact with the visitors, talk about all the fun stuff, not just related to space, but sort of all of science. Um, but I also like to share my love of space through other mediums. So I do the York Universe radio show with you um, and some other colleagues. I also just talk about space through my social media channels at SciComm Sarah. So I just, whatever fun stuff that's happening, you know, there's a comment up there right now, just take a picture and sort of give people a heads up of go and check this out. Um, but I also work in the education development field, thinking about uh, best practices of how to incorporate teaching into, um, you know, higher education, mostly in university levels. Uh, but yeah, a little bit of education, a little bit of science, a little bit of talking about science so yeah <laughs> you really do seem to do a little bit of everything it's it's really um, inspiring because it's hard I think it's really hard to a focus on so many different aspects within science and education and outreach yet you do it all very very well like I'm always seeing something oh Sarah's doing this this talk over here or Sarah's doing this thing or any events that I end up going to, I inevitably see you as being part of it, which is really fun. It's nice that we have this this community uh, within the greater Toronto area of, of space people, space enthusiasts. And and I'm also trying to connect more with all of you lovely people because um, that's it's a lot of fun to talk to you about your experiences. And so, um, you know, you and I, I think, uh, have aside from crossing paths at the Science Center, um, we recently did the the Museum of the Moon. That well, I say recently. It was almost a year ago now, um, mm -hmm. before all the craziness happened in the last little bit. But um, could you could you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah. So Museum of the Moon was all about the moon. At first, I was a little hesitant about it because there was going to be this giant moon globe uh, hanging right under the gardener in Toronto. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be another rubber ducky thing where it's just going to be a photo op and there's going to be, you know, nothing about the moon really. But um, I love what it actually ended up being. So there was a lot of conversation about the moon. Um, you know, I gave a talk just talking about moon exploration, you know, the Apollo era, where we're headed next. Um, you know, you gave a talk about, well, what do we see in the sky right now? as you're out here, you know, checking out this giant moon hanging out, hanging around. Um, they had some meditation. Um, I think there was like a little bit of something for everyone, something that someone could relate to. And the look of it itself was, was pretty good because you don't get, um, like the skies from downtown Toronto are not the best for, uh, for astronomy. I mean, you, you do see the moon, but just to, you know, lay back on the grass and see this giant moon hanging there 
um, it was a lot of fun. And just to be able to talk to people about the moon, yeah, you're looking at that, but what are like all these circles that you're looking uh, and seeing on the moon and then getting some, you know, science behind just this giant moon globe that was, uh, that was hanging there. It was really nice that it had a scientific feel to it. You know, and, I, and what blew me away was how many thousands of people showed up just to see this giant replica. And I mean, they originally, they called it kind of an art and science installation, right? It was it was very much this, this artistic thing. As you said, they had the meditation. Um, but I, I felt that the science of it was really well represented with having speakers like yourself uh, there to actually talk about, the experts talk mm -hmm. about the science of the moon and why it's fascinating and why it's interesting beyond just being this crazy thing that we look at in the sky. Um, so what, now you, you do a lot of things in astronomy and space, a lot of communication. Where did it all begin? What led you down this path originally? Were you very young? Did you start a little bit later in life? Um, I guess my love of astronomy, you know, there are people that sort of figure out what they want to study or what they're interested in later on in life but i guess for me it was always space there was like it was there's just nothing else it was always space um you know just started with seeing comet hale bob this like super bright thing with a tail in the middle of the sky um or seeing solar eclipses and all these events and just seeing you know it's not things that you experience every day um, a lot of it, people are like, oh, it's once in a lifetime or, you know, this won't happen for another 30 years. Um, and the fact that there was so much unknown, I felt like, like I always wanted to make a discovery. I was obsessed with like, you know, you read all these history books or science books and, you know, you have to memorize all these names. And I'm like, I want people to start memorizing my name. I want to make a big discovery. Um, or I wanted to be an astronaut. You know, and when I was in high school, I actually thought, you know, in grade like nine, 10, I thought that, you know, you would go to university and there was a program to become an astronaut. So when we had meetings with like the guidance counselors, um, they're like, okay, so what do you want to do so that we can plan your courses for grade 11 and 12? And I'm like, astronaut school. And she like laughed. And I'm like, that's, that's kind of rude. Like, why are you laughing? I'm serious. And she's like, no, like there's no such a thing as an astronaut school. So I was in grade 10 when I found out there's no such thing as an astronaut school. Um, and then she told me about like astronomy and space and engineering and um, sort of all the other fields that are sort of related to space that could lead you down a path of maybe becoming an astronaut. Um, so that's where that's where it started. I'm like, okay, cool. New York University has a space science program. It's not astronomy. It's not space engineering. It's kind of unique. Let me go into that. Um, and that's sort of where it started. I and I ended up studying studying space science. Um, actually, while I was in grade twelve, I did a co-op at uh, York University Observatory, um, and that was really good for me because I got to talk to students that were at different levels, so you know, first years, fourth years, uh, grad students, professors. So it gave me a better picture of what studying astronomy in space could look like in reality. Um, and that's where my path of studying stuff happened. Now you mentioned like, I'm always giving a talk here and a talk there. Um, when I started as a co-op student at the observatory at York, or even in my first year, um, I loved being at the observatory. I loved looking through the telescope and finding objects. But a part of that was also giving presentations to the public, you know, talking to the public about what they were seeing, um, or if it was a rainy day, this was my nightmare. If it was a rainy night, we had to give a slideshow presentation. So this is back with like the actual like slides, not even PowerPoint presentations. But you would have to stand in front of the room and then talk about stuff. And I wouldn't. I would always like fake sick, go to the bathroom and hide for as long as I could because I hated talking in front of people. Um, but luckily, I worked with some great people that just, you know, pushed me to do a little bit at a time um, and just seeing how excited people would get about learning about things and asking questions that motivated me to sort of overcome my fears and just practice. And now, you know, you can't stop me from talking about space. So I'll stop here now. <laughs> 
I was going to say, you do seem very confident in front of a crowd, in front of a, a group of people. It's important to know that that doesn't come naturally, right? That we all kind of have that that starting thing. So I'm, I'm really impressed that you were able to overcome that shyness and really and, and continue to grow so much. Like you're, I would say you're an excellent presenter now. Uh, and I think it's, it's almost good in a way to have that trial by fire when you're a little bit younger, when you're starting out. Um, I think that's what York Universe Radio is very good for. I think that's what the observatory is good for. Um, and it really speaks to when you're uncomfortable with something, maybe that's a good thing for your development, for your growth. Yeah, and it's really important, um, you know, the people that are around you are super important just to give you, you know, to make you more comfortable, let you do just a little bit and, you know, be like, we're right here. If you mess up or if you don't know or whatever, we'll just jump in so you can do it more freely. So the people that are around you play a big part in it as well. Very true. At one point you mentioned about wanting to discover something when you were younger. Uh, and you have done some actual research. You're a, a PhD. You, you've done your research on the moon. Could you tell me a little bit more about your lunar research? Yeah, um, so I did make an actual discovery. <laughs> but I guess that's what all of science is. Um, and, you know, discoveries change all the time. Uh, but for my, for my PhD research, uh, I started looking at craters on the moon the circular features that we have when an asteroid impacts the surface of the moon. Um, and the question I wanted to answer was, so we had this new data set. Let me take a step back. There's this um, spacecraft that's been orbiting the moon for over 10 years, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it has all these cool instruments that are collecting data in different wavelengths. So there's um, you know visible images, but there's also temperature data. And from there, from just temperature, we can figure out how much rock is in a certain area. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, when we have a new crater forming on the surface of the moon, it sort of excavates a lot of rocks that just sit around that crater for a long, long time. And then over time, over about um, a billion years or so, all of these large rocks get broken down into sand or into regolith because they're just getting bombarded by more stuff over time. Um, and I talked about temperature and it goes back to the concept of sort of thermal inertia and everyone's experienced this at the beach, you know, you're at the beach, it's a hot day, um, you know, during the day, the big rocks and the sand are equally as hot, but as soon as the sun sets, the sand gets cold, but the big rocks, they can stay warm for longer. And we use that concept. So my supervisor, Rebecca Gunn, had come up with this idea that we can use that as a proxy of trying to determine ages for craters. So if they have more big rocks around them, so they look warmer or they have, they look pretty hot in the nighttime temperature, they look really rocky, it means that they're fresher, younger craters. But if you don't see anything around them anymore, it means that, well, you know, they're over a billion years old. So using that relationship, I then started to look at the entire moon because we have data from all around the moon from this spacecraft to figure out how old these um, young craters were. So anything younger than about a billion years was sort of the limit of our, of our data. So first thing was, okay, let's map all of these craters, see where they are, and then get ages for them. And then there's been this idea that um, the bombardment rate on the moon has been fairly constant in the past billion years or so. So there's the giant impact hypothesis that says, you know, four billion years ago, three and a half billion years ago, there was a lot of bombardment. So that's when the earth and the moon were just forming at the beginning of their formation. But after that original spike or peak, everything started to calm down and things have been happening at a constant rate. Um, and when I looked at that data, we saw sort of a jump or a peak at about 400, 300 million years ago. So it wasn't all constant. There was actually a peak. And we're like, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so this goes against previous ideas. And then we thought, okay, for fun, let's compare it to craters on the Earth because the Earth is, the moon is such a close neighbor to us that whatever that's happened on the moon must have happened on the Earth as well. And on the Earth, there's been all these events, you know, we hear about like dinosaur extinctions or going from, you know, single cells to multi cells. And it doesn't mean that 
um, an asteroid impact has necessarily caused the other one. It just means that it must have developed enough changes in the environment that has led to something pretty big and significant. So we started to look at the Earth and interestingly enough, we see the same footprint on the Earth as well. I mean, we were expecting to see it, but we thought mm, maybe not. And that was that was really cool to see that the two really did match and to be able to say, oh, well, things haven't been constant. It has changed in the past 400 million years. Well, what could this mean? You know, we, we're starting to learn more and that gets us to ask more questions. And that's what I love about discoveries is that once you learn something new, then there's, you know, 10 other questions that come from there. And it's sort of like just going down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out all these things that you didn't even think about before. <laughs> Were, were you excited when the data matched up? Like when you saw the that data of the Earth matching up exactly, well, not exactly, but close enough to the, the lunar timeline, did that kind of give you that like, holy smokes, we can't, we actually found something really amazing here? Yeah, so um, I mean, when the moon stuff was cool enough that we're like, and, and in, in an academic setting, you know, you get, some, you get some results, you check it and you're like, okay, we can now publish it and tell the public about it. And then one of our colleagues was like, hold on, let's compare this to the Earth just for fun. You know, we probably won't see it because, you know, we have a lot of erosion on Earth. It erases a lot of stuff. But we picked really, really large craters so that it would be stable on Earth as well. And it matched up and we're like, whoa, OK, now this is something that we can take to even a bigger journal or a bigger publication because this, the results are a lot more significant when you can directly relate it to the Earth as well. So it was really, really exciting, but it also meant that, you know, with every big discovery, you really, really need to prove it. You really need to make sure that you've done your, you know, you've checked and double checked and triple checked. And that's why you collaborate with more people that have more expertise in different fields. Like, okay, let's statistically check and make sure, um, you know, we're not just seeing what we want to see, that it's actual real data. Let's bring in specialists that can tell us, OK, how stable was the Earth's crust in the areas that we were looking at? Um, so it's, you know, you always have to double check, triple check, bring in more experts. So it was super exciting to work with more people to really verify. And like after a couple of years, be like, yes, it's it's actual things. It's not just stuff that I want to see. It's real. I swear it's real. <laughs> That's very humbling to talk about science in that way, right? To, to, that is the crux of the scientific method, is that even when you, you see the data, you still have that mental check of, well, wait a second, am I seeing this properly? Am I seeing this because I'm really excited about this being a discovery? Or, okay, let's step back. And it, it, it's amazing that you, you can do that we can take our ego out of it and collaborate and, and get something better out of it in the long run. So well done. Um, a little bit. So you, that was one of your big goals in from when you were young was to say, I'm going to go discover something. And you did, but surely, you know, you're still very young in your career. What other goals do you have uh, short term, long term? What kinds of things do you really want to accomplish in the field? Like things that I never thought about that I think about a lot more now are a result of my experiences, my own experiences of um, going through my studies and the environments that I was in and realizing things that could have really um, improved my experience, but also other people with similar um, sort of um, backgrounds and stuff. So in, in the STEM fields in general, science, technology, engineering, math, um, space is no exception, planetary science, astronomy, no exception, but it's a, they're, they're mostly highly male dominated field. So I was often one of the only women in my classes, one of the only, uh, you know, minorities in my classes. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm just sick of going to conferences and seeing all these keynotes uh, by people that look more or less the same. Um, you know, it doesn't take away anything from the cool science or discoveries that they're doing, but I'm sure there must be other people that are doing the same work, if not, you know, better or different. Um, so one of my goals was to one, make um, science space in particular, more accessible in terms of, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, you don't need to own a telescope to be an astronomer. I don't have a telescope. I don't even have binoculars. 
Uh, but you don't you don't need to own you know expensive equipment um, to do things. Um, you don't need to belong to a certain group or class to study what you want. Um, and you don't even need to pursue it professionally. You don't need to go to a university to become an astronomer. You can just do it for fun. You can even do it through social media. So one of the things that I do is just to try it make to try and make it more accessible in different platforms, you know, radio, little YouTube videos, social media, talks here and there, and just share that excitement with people. Let them know that they can also go out and discover things and explore things. But also, I really want to highlight the achievement of women, non-binary, minorities in the field, um, highlight their achievements, but also create an environment where we can um, collaborate more, network more, build more mentorships, um, and that has led to uh, me co-founding the Women in Space Conference, which is basically that um, all of our keynotes are done by women and non-binary folks in the field. Um, we have panels and discussions around what it takes to be a human um, scientist. So being a scientist, it's not just discoveries. It's all of, you know, to bring your full self and fully represent who you are with all of your challenges to overcome them um, sort of give you tools to overcome them or just the space to talk about them and not feel like your experiences are, um, you know, you're, you're alone in your experiences. Um, so that's one of my goals is just, you know, to help with making a more inclusive environment, to share my love of space and hopefully inspire more people to, um, to follow their own passions and dreams. That's a really wonderful message. And you've been working so hard on doing that already. You've accomplished a lot with it. The, uh, the Women in, in Space Conference, uh, I think, how many people did you have at the last in-person conference? We had about 200 people at the last in-person conference. That's incredible. Yeah. And um, we were supposed to have the third one uh, just this previous May, which got postponed to next May. And I guess... Um, a measure of success for us was just people's feedback, saying that this was the first conference where they could bring their whole selves to, where they didn't have to just put on their scientist face and show up. And we had a few um, organizations reach out to us and say, hey, we want to host it next year. Um, so next year we're going to be hosting at the Canadian Space Agency, um, which we're super excited about. Um, and. I guess, meanwhile, since we've had to postpone, we were like, okay, we don't want to hold off from seeing our colleagues and sort of having this momentum going. We want to keep going. Uh, so we've started to have monthly webinars the last Thursday of every month, uh, 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And we pick different topics. One we did on uh, personal branding and sort of um, having like an elevator pitch. If you're going to meet someone and you want to talk about your research in three minutes or in a minute, really what you would do. Um, we talked about challenges and failures um, as one of our workshops. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about different things, how to write a resume, uh, networking. And yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. It's a really great professional development opportunity as well. So those are some fantastic goals for the future. And it seems like you're really in the midst of achieving them right now. So really, I think the sky is the limit. Except it's not because we're astronomers and the sky we know is not the it's limit. Not the limit. <laughs> not at all. Uh, but since the sky is not the limit, um, I want to ask you, ask this of all of my guests, what is your favorite celestial object and why? I think I know the answer for you, but <laughs> uh, I still want to hear it anyway. Well, the obvious one is the moon. <laughs> and I think, I don't know, I feel like the moon is sometimes... Um, overlooked in a sense when we talk about when we talk to people in our field of space and astronomy because um, everyone's like oh we've been to the moon let's move on to the next thing but I just love that it's literally like it's in our backyard um, it's right there um, like you mentioned at the beginning as I think one of your other guests had mentioned too everyone has some sort of a connection to the moon I love that, you know, you could be, so when, when we just immigrated to Canada and I miss my friends and my family, um, you know, like the only thing that we all had in common in a way was that we were all looking up at the same moon, if that makes any sense. So every time I'm like, 
and there's like so much poetry and everything around it around the moon as well so I'm like oh, okay well like everyone's looking at the same moon and it sort of helped me feel connected to other people and I know a lot of other people have told me the exact same story and feeling of how it makes them feel connected to other people that they miss um but it's right there everyone in a way has a connection with it but it's also we've been there we have a lot of data from it but our questions are not all answered there's still so many questions um that we need to answer and the more we learn about the moon the more we learn about the earth's past uh, i always say this i always say the moon is a time capsule for stuff that has happened on the earth it has no you know atmosphere no tectonic activity it's it's preserved everything that's happened to us both um so i think it's pretty cool and with all of these talks about going to mars and beyond you know i i think we need to test drive everything on the moon so that's why i think the moon is pretty awesome couldn't have asked for a better answer that was wonderful um I love the, I love the time capsule analogy too. I think that's so so cool. Um, that said, so we're talking about the moon and we're talking about Mars. It's been a bit of a hot topic in the past couple of years because of the Artemis program. When do you think people will actually walk on the moon again? And when do you think the first person will walk on Mars? Hmm. So the Artemis program, I mean, they keep saying the dates keep shifting a little bit, but I'm optimistic that if the funding stays in place, um, that we could have humans back on the surface of the moon by, you know, I think personally 2025, the latest, um, but probably sooner. But as with anything space exploration, it's really dependent on funding and it changes with um, every every um, person's agenda as I guess uh, things change in the White House mainly as that's where most of the funding is coming from in the US right now for the Artemis program. Although SpaceX and some other private companies are getting in so that makes me more ho hopeful that maybe it will not be as dependent on politics and hopefully it will just be on rich people giving money to space. <laughs> So I think 2025, having the next humans on the moon, we've been there. It's only a matter of let's go to a new place. Now we know before it was more like let's test the technology of just um, getting on the moon. But now we've really identified places that could really help us answer valuable questions. Um, so that's that's pretty good. Mars, on the other hand, I'm a little bit I'm not as optimistic as some other people are about Mars. Um, I think we still have a long way to go. There's still a lot to to learn. The journey itself, you know, six months to get there. Like, how? Like, I, I don't want to sit beside anyone in a tiny place for six months unless you're going to put me to sleep and guarantee that I'm going to wake up when we're there. Uh, but, you know, learning how do we do, how do we actually, like, how do humans travel uh, for that long. And then once we're there, how do we sustain ourselves? It's not like a quick trip back to the earth. Um, so I think I think we still have a long way to go. But there, there's, there are a lot of people working on all different aspects of it. You know, um, just the human physiology of being on the moon, the psychology of it, sorry, on Mars, um, how to grow things that we can eat on Mars, how to build things so that we don't have to carry them the water aspect. There's a lot of people working on different aspects, but I don't think, I hope it happens in my lifetime, uh, but I definitely don't think it will be any time before 2030. You made a very good point about the collaborative aspect that we talk about going into space. It's not just space people. It's not just astronomers. It's not just aerospace engineers. There is a, a huge psychology aspect. There's a huge botany aspect. The movie The Martian didn't teach us that. Um, <laughs> there's there's so many different aspects of getting human beings to space. But now, as you said, six months to get to Mars, another six months to get home. That's a long time to be in outer space in a tin can with several other people. Yeah. And so there are a lot of challenges that... Frankly, we're going to need a lot of different areas of science to solve. So thank you for touching on that point. I like this question a lot. If you could chat for an hour, a day, however long, with any scientist, living or dead, who would you choose? 
and why? That's also another tough one. It's like picking a favorite celestial object. Um, there's always a lot of people, I guess not purely scientists either, but within um, the STEM fields that I've always admired. Um, so I'll name a few and then I'll pick one and I'll tell you why. But a few people that I really admire and I wish I had a chance to you know, go back in time and have lunch with them or have the opportunity in the future uh, one of them is uh, Mariam Mirzakhani. She was a mathematician, the first woman to win the field medals, uh, which is pretty unique in the math uh, in the math field. Um, you know, we share the same um, origins, I guess, and that's sort of like it helps me. It makes me feel connected to her, and I want to learn more. I wish I could have learned more about her, about her journey, and what it felt like to get that medal. I guess. Um, and also, I have a few favorite astronauts that I would want to chat with as well. And I think they all have something unique that I connect with. And I would want to talk to them more about those. There's like um, Anisha Ansari, Julie Payette, Chris Hadfield, you know, some of the all time favorites, um, great science communicators. They've done, they've really paved the way forward for other people. But if I could pick one person, um, it would probably be Jocelyn Bell Burnell, um, who co-discovered the first radio pulsars um, back in the day. And the reason I would pick her to have lunch with, I guess, if I had to only pick one person, um, First of all, her discovery was awesome. Um, it, it's like my discovery is nowhere near her discovery. So hers is pretty brilliant. Um, but I would want to learn more about um, how she came up with that discovery, how like what it felt like to be um, in her shoes at a time. But also she didn't win the Nobel Prize for it although she was the one that really discovered it or co-discovered it. It went to her supervisor. Um, and we, we talked a little bit, we touched on it a little bit about the inclusivity and diversity in science and astronomy. Um, and I wanna know how she overcame that. I feel like if that had happened to me, um, I would have such a hard time overcoming it. You know, now I would take onto Twitter and write about it and all of that stuff. Um, and get some justice, but before, like before the times of social media, before it was even, you know, you know, was it even, did she even feel like she could speak up about it? Um, was it just the norm that supervisors would sort of get all the recognition for it? Um, what would she do differently if she had made that discovery today? But also I really wanna know how she dealt with that. I think a big part of it is how do you overcome that and still move on and still do so many amazing things and not let that hold you back? I feel like if that happened to me, I would have just been like, goodbye, science. You know, I'm just going to I have a hard time dealing with um, injustice. So I would really want to learn more about how she dealt with it and moved on. So we've talked about people that you look up to in the world of science and math and astronomy. You look up to a lot of astronauts. Uh, would you want to go into outer space given the chance? Would you jump at that chance if somebody said, hey, you're going to be the next astronaut? I would. I definitely, absolutely would. I always say my thing was, you know, in high school, you have these like, I don't know, especially back in my days, you have like a signature in your email or like a little quote that you have or whatever. My thing was always one day I'll go dancing on the moon. Um, and I hope, I mean, I don't know realistically if that will happen or not, but if someone told me, hey, you can go to the moon tomorrow, I'd be like, thank you, I'm on it. Although I've discovered recently as like in the past few years that I get really bad motion sickness when I'm like, in a car for like a long distance. Um, but I'm, I'll figure that out. I mean, I take, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out. Sign me up. I'm up for it. Um, there's a lot that goes into being an astronaut. So I would have to really start physically training for it too, but I'm up for it. Yes, I would go <laughs> the short answer. Yes. <laughs> Is the moon as far as you would go? Would you go to Mars given the chance? No. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's it. You're over. You're over the moon. Well, you're over Mars, but you're over the moon for the moon, I guess. Eh? That's great. Yeah. I mean, if if there if there have been people to the Mars successfully and back, and then yes. But right now, no. I will not be the first person to go to Mars. <laughs> Well, and it's it's good that one of the things you notice about astronauts today is that I think the people who do end up going to Mars first are going to be experienced astronauts, people who have proven that they could get through uh, an orbital mission on the International Space Station, or maybe even some of the first lunar astronauts will be the ones to make that next leap as well. So it's good that when you become an astronaut, you can start out with low Earth orbit, you can get to the moon, and then after that... They'll say, well, okay, you're experienced now. Do you want to go to Mars? And, and maybe you'll have a different answer then. Now that you've told me some of the people who really inspire you, I'm sure you hope to be an inspiration to younger kids as well over time. I'm sure you are right now. But if you could give some advice to young people who are coming into astronomy, coming into science, who are interested in pursuing some kind of scientific career, what advice would you have for them? Um, I think my biggest advice would be to find a mentor. Um, I was fortunate enough to have people that I could go to, um, to, you know, get some advice, to ask some questions, especially at an undergraduate level. But if you're pursuing it higher, um, I think it's really important to find people um, that have maybe had similar experiences as you. So if you um, run into a challenge or a problem, um, you're probably not the first one and you're not the only one that this has happened to. So don't internalize it um, and try to find a mentor that will help you get through that process, whether it's, you know, in an academic way or in a more, more professional way. Finding a mentor, I think it's is really important. And another thing is um, don't let other people define what you can and cannot do. There will, you will come across a lot of people that will, um, you know, tell you what you can and cannot do or what you're good at and what you're not good at. And that, that's another thing. I don't think there's such a thing as being good at something. I failed grade 12 chemistry. Like I had to stay back another semester and retake a bunch of courses so that I could go to university. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm not good at chemistry. I was just not in a good headspace. When I took first year chemistry at university, I studied, I did my homework, um, I got extra help when I needed to, and I got an A in the course. Like it does not define who you are. Um, it's just about the amount of work that you put in, the amount of effort that you put in, and also that it's okay to change your mind. You might go into a program and then realize it's not for me, or I don't really enjoy it. And last thing, something that I wish um, someone had told me, I kind of knew it, but I didn't take it as seriously, was to really think about what I want to do when I graduate from a program, if I'm like going to university or college, and looking into the job landscape, figuring out how many jobs are there in that field realistically, what are the other types of jobs that I could do with that degree, and would I be happy doing them? And if not, just to take a step back, reevaluate and realize that some things can stay as hobbies, some things I can do on the side, um, and to really think about it, really think about what you want to do and, um, and go for it. Change your mind, practice, talk to other people. That's excellent advice. As somebody who's in the scientific community, what do you think is going to be the next big discovery in astronomy and space in the next, let's say, 10 years? That's a really good question. Honestly, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I've, I always think about that. Um, and there's so many ways that it can go, but I think it's probably something to do with space exploration and Mars, um, just based on our obsession with it. But there's, I mean, we have good reason to be obsessed with it. We have so many rovers and orbiters that are getting launched just this month, like July and August of 2020. Um, and it's because we want to learn more. So we want to be sure that, you know, was there life on Mars? Can there be life on Mars? What is it that could have had, could have had life on Mars? And I think whatever we learn from the next set of, um, Mars exploration missions that we have, 
um, is going to really pave the way for the next set of for our sort of next step beyond Mars and discovery. I think what we learned from these set of Mars missions is going to really um, give us a direction of where to go or where to start digging next. You might have hinted at this just a little bit, but what do you think about life in the universe? Life in the universe. I I find it odd that we would be the only sort of life in the universe. I mean, we've started to, um, you know, think about microbial life that could live in other places, but even intelligent life, I don't know. I think there's definitely life of some sort out there as we've sort of proven already within places in our solar system. But I find it hard to believe that we're the only living beings here like the earth is pretty unique but we're only scratching at the surface of finding exoplanets planets around other stars like when i was in high school exoplanets were not a thing really um so i think that's probably another big thing in like the next 10 years of discoveries as well is the more we're learning about all these other planets could there be life i definitely think we're up for a nice surprise <laughs> oh that's great Thank you, Sarah, for coming on to Astro Views. If somebody wants to connect with you, uh, ask you some questions, talk to you more about your journey, where would they find you? Yeah, I always love talking about space or science or anything, life in general. I love connecting with new people. Um, on social media, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook, you can just find me at SciComSarah. Sarah. Um, or you can reach out to me through my website as well, which is just sarahmazuri.com. Perfect. Thanks a lot for being on the show. We really appreciate your time. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. And this concludes our episode of Astro Views, the show where we talk to interesting people about their connection with the universe. Keep coming back for more guests. We've got a lot of great people on the horizon, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in. People think that it can be very difficult to do astronomy without a telescope or without binoculars or without this expensive equipment, but really all you need is your eyes and your curious mind. And to help that, Astronomy in Action has come up with our own space club. And this isn't a space club where you need a telescope or binoculars or to stay up all night. In partnership with SLU.com, we give you access to remote telescopes all over the world so that when you feel the time is right, you can pop online and look through one of their huge telescopes that they have in these perfectly clear dark sky sites around the world. You can take your own images, learn about different objects through quests and challenges, and have a lot of fun as part of our community. If you'd like to join, go to astronomyinaction.com spaceclub. We hope to see you there.